This morning we are finishing our series called Healthy Homes. And it's a privilege to be able to share God's Word this morning. And uh, I could stand up here and talk about a whole list of uh, perhaps helpful behaviours that would increase the likelihood of you having a healthy home. Because this whole idea of healthy homes is actually about healthy relationships. Whether we're married, whether we're single, whether we're single again, whether we are sharing a flat with a group of people, whatever our home looks like, whether we have children, whether we don't, whether we have grandchildren, we all have um, a sphere of relational influence with people in our lives. And yes, there is lots of practical things we can do to contribute to healthy relating within the families and the homes we belong to, the families and the homes that we're part of. And some of them we didn't actually get to choose. Some of them we did. (laughs) But I did this search of uh, books on Kurong, which is a Christian bookstore, and uh, did an online search and looked up how many books there are that address relationships in some way or form on their website. And it came up with 2,819 results. That's a lot. (laughs) And I'm sure if I looked on Amazon, the list would be even bigger. Like just not even Christian books, but just books that generally deal with relationships. Because many of us are looking for the secret source that's going to make our relationships better. Don't you reckon? So a list could be helpful. But I'm not going to talk about a list because a to-do list can't bring about real and lasting change. Trying to behaviour manage our way into better relationships is not sustainable and the wi- one of the wisest and most practical things the Bible talks about is, talks to is the condition of our hearts. Because we convince ourselves that we're doing better than we really are, don't we? Well, at least I'm not as dysfunctional as Cass. Maybe some of you have said that. (laughs) That's okay. Jesus loves me. Insert the name. You know, it might be your boss, your colleague, your sister, your kids, your friend, We can keep at it for a time, this behaviour management, but under times of stress or added pressure, what's in us comes out of us. Most of us are also aware of the areas where we fall short. Can I hear an amen? (laughs) We're aware of them. With people we know and especially with people we have allowed close to us, we can't actually hide who we really are. And this can feel like a scary place to be. And I know in a room this size, there's some of us here who find that really uncomfortable that we can't hide who we really are because we feel vulnerable or because we may not like ourselves very much, because we're scared that people will push us away or because we've been hurt in the past. Yep, most of us are aware of areas where we fall short, and we're certain we know the areas where others fall short. I reckon there's been a bit of elbow nudging happening in this series. (laughs) We look for that special ingredient of how to make our relationships work better, but often... We have mixed motives. We want to know how to manipulate or change others to get what we want. True? It's not a nice thing to think about sometimes, but it really is true. (laughs) We know how we need to change, but we're powerless to change ourselves. And so this morning, I really believe that Jesus wants to minister deeply, powerfully, transformingly into our hearts to hearts that are hurting, hearts that are full of disappointment or deferred hope, 
hearts that are heavy. And if you don't know Jesus or you're here for the very first time and you don't know what to think about this Jesus guy, they talk about him a lot, (laughs) that is totally okay. Do you know what it takes usually four times for a person coming along to a church to work out what they think about Jesus? So if that's you, I want to say keep coming back. Keep coming back. Keep your heart open. Keep exploring what it means to follow Jesus and what he's all about. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, the Bible tells us that where two or three people are gathered to worship and hear from Jesus, that he is there with them by his Holy Spirit. And so we can't physically see Jesus this morning, but he is here. Many of us have already sensed his presence And we can open up our hearts. What are you saying to me, God, through your word? Because he's here, he's risen, and he alone has the power to change the human heart and transform our lives to become more like him. Because healthier hearts can impact and influence healthier relationships. And so before we keep going, I want us to pray. God, what are you saying to me about my heart this morning? Can we do that? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we can come before you with assurance that you are here, that you see us and know us, that you love us unconditionally, and you're here to help. And so we give you access into our hearts, Lord. We say, have your way. Take the word that's spoken this morning and apply it to every heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Do you know, a few months after becoming a brand new Christian, I remember getting so annoyed with myself. Some of you might have had this experience. (laughs) And so down on myself for doing something wrong. I can't even remember what it was. I was rehearsing it over and over and over in my mind. And I remember sitting in my car And just feeling horrible about myself. And there, seemingly alone, I now know that I wasn't, (laughs) sitting in that car, this Bible verse came to my mind. And in the midst of destructive thinking, not really understanding how to follow Jesus by relying on the Holy Spirit instead of my own effort, God's love broke through. God's truth broke through and I really got it was a revelation moment, an aha moment for the very first time. And it was this, I can't obey God by serving and trying harder. I can't become more like Jesus by being better behaved. I can't grow healthy relationships by working my to-do list. (laughs) And the Bible verse, what was it? Well, it was Galatians 2.20. It says this. This just popped into my head. I have been crucified with Christ. And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And I had this aha moment that I no longer live. The old cast is actually gone. (laughs) My sinful nature has been crucified with Jesus. When he died, my old life and my old way of doing things died. And I can't squeeze myself into being a more holy Christian. Jesus Christ now lives in me. He lives his life through me. And I'm already made holy by his once and for all sacrifice. As I trust in him that he loves me, that he gave his life for me, that he can live his life through me. As I stop trying so hard and start trusting, putting the full weight of my trust, that he lives in me and can flow through me. He will. (laughs) He cares about my relationships with my family, the people I do life with. He will help me now do what my heart longs to do because he's given me a brand new heart. He's taking my heart of stone and giving me a heart of flesh, a heart that wants to do what he wants me to do. But to grow and relate to my family in healthy ways that honour him and to reap 
long-lasting and generational impact and legacy. I need to stop trying harder. (laughs) Some of you, this verse is God's hope and truth breaking into you today. The life I now live, you need to say this perhaps in your mind or ask God to bring it back to your mind this week. The life I now live, this is a new declaration. It's a new confession over you and over your family. The life that I now live, I live by what? Faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The life I now live. You've been trying, trying, trying so hard to obey, but you've forgotten the trust part. And the Holy Spirit's here to remind us this morning. The life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God. And we can tell him, we can reaffirm our trust in him today. Because he loves us and gave his life for us. His resurrection power is now living on the inside. Come on. (laughs) We can believe for his spirit to supernaturally empower us as we say, I can't do it, but Jesus, you can do it through me. Help me now to live your life in and through me. And then as we step out and do what he asks, we can believe for his spirit to empower us supernaturally. What is impossible? I've got nothing left to give this person, nothing. But you can fill me with your love again and you can help me to love them and see them how you see them. Maybe you find it so hard to love your spouse right now. You've been trying, but resentment always creeps in. You need to talk to Jesus about it. Don't edit it when you talk to him about it. Find a secluded secluded place, vent, tell him how it really is, how you really feel. (laughs) He can handle it. But stop trying to behave, manage or manipulate the situation. Tell Jesus your struggle. Invite him in. Be completely honest with him. Get all your emotions out on the table. And then say, okay, now, Lord, what do you got to say? (laughs) What do you got for me? The life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God. Maybe a particular parent is giving you a hard time right now and you have no clue how they think the way they do and why they're being so difficult, but it's driving you nuts. Maybe you're at the end of your rope with frustration with your child right now. They're just pushing the buttons. Maybe one of your family member has significantly betrayed your trust. You need some wise, godly counsel because you can't do it on your own. You can't try and behave you manage the situation. (laughs) You can't work it out in your own strength. But you can invite Jesus in. You can ask him to heal your heart. You can ask him to help you take wise steps forward. Sometimes it means speaking to a counsellor or a trained professional. I think the thing that we sometimes forget is that we are responsible for the condition of our own heart. We can't change it, but we're responsible for it. And many of you have heard the parable of the sower. A parable is a story that is used to illustrate a spiritual truth. In Luke chapter 8, Jesus speaks about this farmer who goes out to plant his seed and the seeds fall in one of four places. The path. And the path, we think of the path being cement. They didn't have cement back then. So the path was actually the place where the dirt became really compacted and pressed down because it had a lot of traffic on it. The path and the bird came and stole and ate the seed. Talks about the thorns. Sorry, the rocks first. The rocks, there's rocks, but when the plant come, came up, it withered because it didn't have any roots, it didn't go down deep. 
talks about the thorns which grew up with the plants and choked them, the weeds that choked out and stunted the growth. And it talked about good soil where the plant was able to come up and produce a crop a hundred times more than was sown. And Jesus explains to us the meaning of the parable. I'm going to read from Luke chapter 8. It's not up on the screen, but from verse 11. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear and then... The devil comes and takes away the word from their heart so that they may not believe and be saved. Think about that path, that compacted dirt. Gets a lot of traffic. If you don't know, when we don't know Jesus and when we, life just happens, there's a lot of traffic that happens on our hearts. There's a lot of trampling that can happen on our hearts. And so the seed of God's word's not able to go into it and the enemy goes, cool. The Bible says that he's blinded the minds of unbelievers, steals that little seed, takes it away but it, before it can even take root. Those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy and when they hear it, they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. The rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. It's like the rocks are around this plant, and the rocks are like stumbling blocks. You know, there's times of testing, there's times of hardship in our life. There's times where we think, you know what, this is all too hard. But in those times, the the root of the plant is meant to draw deeply from the nourishment in the soil. But unless we have discernment or people around us that go, you know what, that's a rock. Don't let that stop you from clinging and drawing deeply from Jesus. You're not alone. (laughs) You can grow through this hard time. When we allow people around us to help us with that, when we own up and bring out to the open our struggles or our rocks, (laughs) We can grow deeper and, and really grow through real, really challenging times because we know the presence of God and his word in our life. The seed that fell among the thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches and pleasures and do not mature. That's a really graphic image, choked. The weeds and the plants choke. <laughs> You know, there's an enemy who wants to steal, kill and destroy your becoming more like Jesus. He wants to steal, kill and destroy healthy relationship. He wants to steal, kill and destroy you being able to break through to the sunlight that helps that plant to grow. But Jesus is able to deal with those weeds and our thorns as we let him in. And then it says... But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by preserving, produce a crop. The good soil, noble and good heart. You know, I said parables contain a story that has spiritual truth. And when we listen to that story, Jesus is trying to create receptivity. He's trying to say, you know what? You're supposed to want the good soil. (laughs) He's supposed to say, you know what, I want that to be said about me, that I have a good and noble heart. But it's also a diagnostic thing because we identify, all of us, with somewhere along that line, areas where we might be letting rocks stunt our growth or where we might be letting weeds or thorns, listening to lies, (laughs) focusing all of our hope and all of our trust on things that are not God first. We're meant to want that good soil because we're responsible for the condition of our hearts but yet we can't make ourselves have good soil. The path can't suddenly disintegrate and become good soil. It needs the farmer to plough it up. 
the soil that had the rocks in it can't just suddenly grow and produce a healthy plant. It needs the rocks to be removed. The plant that was growing where the weeds are and the thorns are can't just keep going and think it's going to be hunky-dory because the weeds and the thorns around it are going to choke this life-giving growth of the plant. So it's meant to be something where we go, you know what, in this area, Lord, where am I? Because <laughs> it's ongoing, isn't it? We can start off with a good and noble heart and have, yes, Jesus, I love you. You've got my whole life, every area, access to you. But over the years, through hurt and disappointment or through you know, distraction, lots of different things, our hearts can become calloused and hard. And that's where we need to cooperate with the Holy Spirit and say, Farmer Jesus, <laughs> Dr. Jesus, my heart isn't as healthy as I'd like to think it is. I need you to come in and plough the ground. I need you to come in and put the healing balm of your Holy Spirit in that's going to loosen up that soil and prepare it for good things to come out of it. I need Dr. Jesus to come in and give my heart the medicine that it needs. I need to forgive. <laughs> the wisest and most practical thing the Bible teaches us to do, one of them, is to cooperate with Jesus and allow him to plough up, to change, to search our hearts. Because the Bible says, David said, and he was a guy who got a lot of things wrong, a lot of things wrong, murderer, someone who was manipulating things for his own means. But you know what God said about him? He's a man after my own heart. And I reckon he allowed Farmer Jesus, <laughs> Dr. Physician Jesus, well, God, pre-Jesus, to actually soften his heart. Because he said, he prayed that prayer, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thought, anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me on your everlasting path. And so once we recognise that we're responsible for the condition of our heart and we start to see where our heart is at or the areas where our heart have become calloused and hard or choked out by other things, we bring them to Jesus. We say, Jesus, can you do a work in my heart? Can you make the soil rich and noble and good again so I can produce long-lasting fruit in my life and in my family's life that is going to be honouring to you and it's going to make, help people know who you are and what you're about. Proverbs 4.23 says, Above all else, above all else, what? Guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it. And sometimes we forget just how important the conditions of our hearts are. But the state of our heart affects everything we do. Everything. For everything you do flows from it. And our hearts are shaped early on by the environments of our homes and our upbringing. And some of us have grown up in relatively healthy home environments, not perfect, but relatively healthy, where we've been taught how to weed out the rocks and we've been taught how to not get distracted by the thorns that come along. We've been taught how to let Jesus soften our hearts. But some of us have grown up in families where we have had Constant disappointment, constant hurt, constant betrayal, constant unhelpful examples of how to relate in relationships. Many of us haven't necessarily grown up in environments that have caused our hearts to flourish. But the good news is when we come to Jesus when we give our hearts over to him, <laughs> we can start to grow and let him remove the rocks, put weed killer on the weeds, protect the plant, <laughs> and change and soften us. Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it because as you mature into adulthood, you might not have had, got, had a chance to choose what happened in your childhood, but you do have a chance as you mature into adulthood to decide what the condition of your heart will be. 
And this is a continual choice because there's circumstances that are beyond our control and sometimes hurtful, harmful, destructive things that are aimed to destroy us. To numb our hearts, to kill and destroy a relationship. There's people in our family we can't control, but as far as it depends on us, we can control the attitude of our heart. We can't change it, but we can offer it over to God and say, help me, Lord. And we carry bruised hearts, broken hearts, heavy hearts, disappointed hearts, and after a while they get so calloused and so hard and indifferent. We start to honour Jesus with our lips, but we keep our hearts. What? Far from him. And sometimes we do the same with family members. (laughs) Now, I'm not talking about abusive behaviours. Abusive behaviours are never okay and they need to have a boundary drawn around them. So there may have been things that happened to you that were abusive and that is not okay. But we can still choose what the condition of our heart is going to be going forward. Forgiveness and healing is how God opens and softens our hearts. You know why? So we're not locked up and bound up and not being able to produce something that's going to bless generations to come. So we're not in a prison, really. So we can actually be filled with the love of God so we can love others. So you're responsible for the condition of your heart. You can't change it but you can bring it to Jesus. But you are also the gatekeeper of your heart. That's what that verse says. Above all else, guard your heart. You are the gatekeeper of your heart. You're not the gatekeeper of your circumstances, but you are the gatekeeper of your own heart. You have a choice in what you will and won't let in to your heart and what you will and won't get rid of. Healthy homes and healthy relationships need the continual balm of the Holy Spirit to soften the hard places, to heal the broken and bruised places, to pour in hope where hope seems lost, to lead our hearts to become tender and soft once more so his love and grace can flow through us. To enable us to walk with wisdom and do all we can to live at peace with others to speak the truth and not let the sun go down on our anger. And these are all practical things, but they actually at the very core start with what? Our hearts. Do you know my story? When I think about it sometimes, I just, I have to pinch myself because as a young girl, I faced a really tragic, traumatic thing. My mum passed away. She took her own life. Now, some people don't get over that. Not that I'm saying that that still doesn't impact me, there's not a scar, but God has healed my heart, continues to heal my heart, heal my mind, continues to bring situations where I allow and say, Jesus, come into my heart, help me, I need your help. And it's not about me, I'm not trying to say like I'm awesome, I'm trying to say if God can do it for me, he can do it for you. Like there's some people who literally do not get over this and it becomes this self fulfilling prophecy into the next generation by the grace of God as broken and imperfect as I am I've been able to say with the Holy Spirit's help God come into my heart yes even into that dark room in my heart and bring your healing and life and wholeness so I can be a vehicle of healing and life and blessing to other people you are the gatekeeper of your heart And only you can open your heart to let Jesus in. And this morning he stands at the door and he, what? He knocks. And if you don't know Jesus, he's knocking and he's saying, let me come in. Because when you let me in, you're not trying to do life on your own anymore. (laughs) Your heart is actually safe with me. Because only I will never let you down. I'll never forsake you, I'll never leave you. Only you can invite him in. But if you're here and you have invited him in, sometimes we have him in our hearts. We have him living within us, but we say, not that room. Click, 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 click. 
I don't want you going in there. Because that's going to be uncomfortable, one. Painful, two. Scary, three. (laughs) And the list goes on. But I think the bottom line is, and we're going to take communion in a minute, come around the Lord's table. The bottom line is, is he trustworthy? If you're going to open up your heart to this Jesus, is he actually going to take it and go, or is he going to breathe life onto it, pour some medicine into it, heal it? Is he going to plough it up gently? Based on what he did on the cross, the answer overwhelmingly is yes, 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 yes. He is so trustworthy with your heart.